man has spent almost 16 years ignoring his children while trying to pursue a rap career. Not trying to pursue his GED. Not trying to go to college. I put myself 90 hours through college raising three children on my own. I've always done here. This man does nothing. I slept on the couch. I wasn't even sleep in the bed with her. The reason why he ain't sleeping in the bed, he was never at home. He'll come home when it's time for me to go to work. How you gonna sleep in the bed and you too much in the streets? Because I didn't want to look in your face. I have been homeless because, because of, I can't of pay, the child pay court. my bills. 66 and a third percent of my check. And I can't pay rent. I can't do nothing. I don't have a life. And I have got the proof of my rares when I'm back owed. Can you believe it? She's never even chatted with him on the phone. Ms. Dennis spills the beans that she has never seen, spoken to, or heard the voice of the dude she thinks is her dad. This bombshell kicks off her epic quest to figure out who her real dad is. Buckle up, because it's about to get even crazier. But you have never seen him. You have never spoken to him. Him. So today will be the very first day you will do that. And I wanted to make sure you were okay and you were prepared. All I've known of him is these pictures that I've had my entire life. These are pictures of my mother and him at their wedding. And so you've had these pictures, but you have not had your biological father. Not one bit. Hold the phone. Here's where it gets juicy. Judge Lake rolls out the red carpet with the case of Dennis versus Dennis, where Ms. Dennis is about to eyeball her supposed dad for the first time. The plot thickens as Mr. Dennis throws in a curveball, totally denying he's her biological dad. This drama is heating up and you'll want to see what's next. Miss Dennis, today will be the very first day you've ever laid eyes on the man you known to be your father. And I just want to make clear that you understand that Deny is your biological father. Jerome, at this time, I'd ask that please escort Mr. Dennis into the courtroom so we can begin the yes. proceedings. Wait till you hear this doozy. Mr. Dennis lays down his side of the story, blaming his wife's possible side adventures for his doubts about being the father. His tale is full of suspicions and unresolved drama it makes you want to grab some popcorn. And guess what? It's only going to dive deeper from here. My position here right now today is to give her closure, being the father or not being the father, which to me, I believe I'm not. Because when me and her mother were married, I was a truck driver at the time. On Memorial Day weekend, I was down in Florida. I called her phone. She is out on the lake in the middle of the night by herself on an antique wooden boat with her ex-boyfriend. Check this out. In a plot twist, Mr. Dennis whips out evidence that he's been asking for a DNA test, which he claims got shot down more times than he can count. This stack of paperwork adds a whole layer of frustration and legal shenanigans to his story. Hold on to your seats. The next part is a real kicker. I have requested from her mother, and I have proof for DNA test and everything else, that I have been denied by courts from her mother and everybody else. What is this, sir? That is proof of the DNA request that I have requested from the courts. Yeah, but with her mother denying, I could not get a DNA test. I heard the story, the full story, finally when I was seven or eight years old. You're not going to believe what comes next. Next. Over the phone, Ms. Morrow fires back against Mr. Dennis's cheating claims, insisting she was faithful during their marriage. Their stories clash like superheroes in a blockbuster, with each side dishing out their version of the past. As I recall this situation, it was not after we were married that I went on a boat with a friend, and my yes, children were there. Right. They, in fact, he let my daughter drive the boat. He's a good friend of mine. She was he dating was him just at letting the time us... we met. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Dennis, that you cheated with him. She is which led to you story. becoming pregnant. This part is a tearjerker mixed with a facepalm. Mr. Dennis drops a bombshell that he's been slumming it because of the child support for a kid he's not even sure is his. This revelation really shows how messy things have gotten. And just when you thought it couldn't get more tangled, there's more drama ahead. Mr. Dennis, you say you have been denied DNA test that you've needed yes, for, for 20 years. something years. I have been homeless because, because I can't of pay, the child pay court. my bills. 66 and a third percent of my check. And I can't pay rent. I I can't do nothing. I don't have a life. And I have got the proof of my rares when I'm back owed. Grab a tissue for this one. Ms. Dennis gets real about how tough it's been growing up fatherless, questioning why her supposed dad never seemed to care. Her emotional unpacking is a gut punch of eels and unanswered questions. Just when you think it's all out on the table, there's a twist coming right up. For a child. My father travels across state lines, drives trucks, makes deliveries, and shows up for a living. But he can't do those things for me. I can understand. That's understand. what she's lived with for 20-something years. Mm -hmm. And I know you are being kind, and I know you are reserving a lot of your emotion because you're trying to be strong. Thank you. Here's the big reveal. Get ready to gasp. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Dennis, you are the father.
Buckle up, Buttercup! The show kicks off with Ms. Nazarene throwing down the gauntlet at Mr. Rami, blaming him for bailing on dad duties and leaving her and their kiddos in a lurch. She's not holding back, accusing him of ghosting them emotionally and financially. Hang tight, because the tea is just starting to spill. Ms. Nazarene, uh, you are here today to sue your ex-boyfriend for being an absentee father and a deadbeat dad. You say he has caused you and your two children much pain and suffering by never stepping up as their father. Mr. Rami claim Ms. Nazarene has done immeasurable to your life and career by her very difficult personality. The gloves are off now. In a fiery exchange, Mr. Rami paints Ms. Nazarene as the queen of drama, irrational, volatile, and a nightmare to chat with. He insists her antics have made his life a roller coaster, but Ms. Nazarene claps back, calling out an incident where she claims Rami swiped $500. What's next? Oh, it's a doozy. Complete irrationality. The decision to be overtly angry, tile, and violent for things that I consider to be then important. Very verbally, physically abusive. Is that true, Ms. No, no, it's absolutely not true. He and I have had one incident where he stole $500 from me and had me and my baby in a car that w had a steering column that failed. Just when you thought it was getting spicy, Ms. Nazarene lays into Mr. Rami for chasing dreams of rap stardom instead of job applications, all while she's been hustling through college and solo parenting their trio. Don't wander off. The fireworks are just getting started. This man has spent almost 16 years ignoring his children while trying to pursue a rap career. Not trying to pursue his GED. Not trying to go to college. I put myself 90 hours through college raising three children on my own. I've always done here. This man does nothing. The fact that we might have some children together and spend a short period of time enjoying each other's company. Plot twist. The judge jumps in to quiz Mr. Rami about his financial contributions, or the lack thereof. Rami admits he's not the most consistent with the checks, but claims he chips in when he can. Oh, snap. Wait till you hear what comes next. It's a real kicker. First of all, she decided to move to the other side of the country without talking to me. Well, it depends on what steady is. No, I haven't sent a every two weeks. No, I haven't. But when I've had a job, I have sent help. You Whenever have she's hit me up for money, if I was able to, yes, absolutely. $100. Yes, oh, absolutely. Over this past 17, 16 years, he paid child support when he was with um, ex second wife. Hold on to your popcorn. Ms. Nazarene drops a bombshell that Mr. Rami pulled a Houdini for three years while she was preggers and solo with a toddler. The crowd goes wild and the plot thickens. You won't believe what's up next. It's straight up soap opera stuff. Okay, so uh -oh. what, what happened to me being seven months pregnant with a one year old and you were gone for three years? Uh -oh. Truth be told. There was an incident. I was asked to bring the car to her because she had Messiah with her. Can you bring the car to Tarzan from Los Angeles? I tell no problem. I would love to do that for you. Actually, what's funny is I'll tell you this story because it's more recent. You'll need to sit down for this one. As they sling text messages at each other like dodgeballs, the tension is palpable. The texts reveal a war of words that's nothing short of a daytime drama spectacle. The next exchange? It's a cliffhanger that'll have you rolling. I ain't damn playing. Not you trying to make me lose my youth because you're a deadbeat. I'm ready to smash you monsters. Your family does not care about us because we're too black skinned to be a big fat yellow hoe to get love and, I mean it. and care. And and that's the truth. And I meant every one of them. Weren't they a young person? Did you say 21 years no, old? No, they were the not The first grandchild. Reference. You might want to grab more snacks for this part. Judge Lake calls Mr. Rami out for his laid-back attitude, which is not winning him any Dad of the Year awards. She doesn't mince words, calling him a loser, in hopes of sparking some sense into him. The curtain's about to rise on the grand finale, and it's a showstopper. Mr. Making Rami, arrangements, will sure. you make that effort to see them tomorrow? Yes. yes. Look, you're a writer, but don't write too it's on the text. Good. Just yes, say tomorrow. Just, and then if you could just give him a time, nothing else, and then you just say, I'll be there. And then I have my hat. Be there. Can you do that? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Here we go. Buckle up for a wild ride. Miss Mitchell spills the beans about meeting Mr. Jordan way back when, at a courthouse at the tender age of seven. Mr. Jordan was there for a child support gig, claimed her as his kiddo, and started shelling out the cash. But, plot twist, he later flips the script and acts like she's a stranger. This scene is just setting the table for a saga filled with more twists and turns in a pretzel factory. At the defendant, Mr. Jordan, in a house when you were seven years old, you claimed he denied paternity testing at that time and claimed you as his daughter and but since that time, he has denied used to treat you like his daughter. Grab your tissues, folks. This one's a heart tugger. Mrs. Mitchell's here today with a mission. Find out if Mr. Jordan really is the old man or just another dude from her mom's past. After losing her mom, she's got more holes in her life than a Swiss cheese, and she's hoping today's the day she starts filling them. The judge gets it, sharing her own tale of loss, bonding right there in the courtroom. Up next, we dive into Mr. Jordan's side of the story. And oh boy, brace yourselves. He is my biological father because I lost my mother a year ago. 
ago from breast cancer. I wanna fill that void. I don't have no one else. It's just me. Not knowing stepped up to the plate during that time, so I only imagine. Let's roll out the red carpet for Mr. Jordan's grand entrance. He dishes out the backstory of their first Corthusadrama, stepping up as the father figure without any DNA proof. Talk about a leap of faith. He even got all fatherly, prepping to adopt her in everything till mama pulled the plug. Hang tight, because Mr. Jordan's about to drop some truth bombs about his daddy. Doubts that'll have you raising your eyebrows. You know, and I found out about her. Hey, all I could do was step up. Saw this young lady in the courthouse. I sat down and spoke with her, and I immediately raised my hand and said, hey, that's, we don't need a attorney to test. I told her, I say, I'm your daddy, baby, right here. Hold on to your seats. We're diving deep now. Mr. Jordan confesses he's been on the fence about being daddy dearest since day one, thanks to a fleeting fling with Mrs. Mitchell's mom. Despite his suspicions, he tried to bond over brake pads. Yep, you heard that right. Car maintenance is father-daughter bonding. But when those brakes bailed the next day, things went south fast. Stick around to see how this mechanical mishap lays out in court. Blow me off every time. It was like every once or twice a year when he said, yeah. Something more. I was trying to teach her how to be self -sufficient. He stood there with me as I was doing my own brakes. I left, went to work the next day. My brakes came off on the freeway. Cue the flashback music because we're zipping back to when Mrs. Mitchell was just a seven-year-old in the courtroom. Mr. Jordan played the hero, volunteering to be her dad in front of a judge and all. But fast forward through the years and it's like he's got amnesia or something, completely bailing on the dad duties. What's next? Watch as Mrs. Mitchell brings out the big guns with some heavy-duty evidence. And a bitch, the judge asked me, do you know who your father is? I said, no. That's when he came up and said what he said about, that's when I was like, okay, well, you my dad. So I'm thinking, he about to start coming over, I'm about to be with him. I didn't see him for years. Even when my daughter passed away, he didn't call me. I didn't know she was pregnant. Things are getting real now. Mrs. Mitchell is not messing around, pulling out her birth certificate, which is as blank as Mr. Jordan's recent memories of fatherhood. She's laying it all out there, showing just how up in the air everything is about who her real dad might be. Don't go anywhere. The emotional roller coaster is just picking up speed. I don't have his name. Nothing. So you're not listed on the birth certificate, sir. And also, sir. mother even doubted me. When I called trying to talk to her, why are you calling my house and that's not your father? But whenever she called me there to help her for whatever no, the reason. No, that's a lie. Oh boy, grab the popcorn because Mrs. Mitchell is reading a letter to Mr. Jordan that's so loaded with emotion it could burst. She's calling him out for missing an action all these years. And let me tell you, it's more dramatic than a soap opera. As she tears into him, everyone's on the edge of their seats. Next up, we've got a sister showdown that's going to crank up the heat even more. Even using that word brings up an image of pain. Lonely nights and years of, I never did anything to you for you to treat me the way you did over the years. There were times when I call you trying to fight in you and all you did was laugh like you're doing now. Ding, ding, ding. Here comes the sister fight you've been waiting for. Mrs. Mitchell and Miss Wagner, Mr. Jordan's confirmed daughter, go head to head, airing out all the dirty laundry. This isn't just a spat. It's a full-on sibling rivalry explosion with accusations and denials flying faster than a gossip at a hair salon. Keep watching because the DNA results are about to drop like a hot potato. Growing up, I'm the first one. So, okay. of course. Of course she always first. I am the first one. We don't know nobody else. Don't Whatever. Girl, stop right here. All this crap. <laughs> no, face. what you are She is not like that. Whatever, you gonna whatever. do what I tell you to do because I'm a No, no. Oh, you gonna tell me. What's interesting are you fighting just like sisters? And now, the moment of truth. Drum roll, please. Mr. Jordan, you are her father. Guess who just entered the chat? Miss Bronson, that's who? She's always seen Mr. Roberts as her dad, but bam. Now she's in court to confirm it because Mr. Roberts is starting to think maybe he's not the father after all. Miss Bronson, you have always known the defendant to be your biological father, but have opened your case against him to prove paternity because he now claims he has reason to deny he is your father. Hold the phone. Mr. Roberts thought all was well in fatherland until a few years ago when someone suggested he might not be the daddy. Enter Mr. Banks, who's also throwing his hat in the paternity ring. You believe Miss Bronson was your firstborn three years ago when your world was turned side down with the news that you may not be her biological father and that Mr. Bank claimed he is. Talk about drama. Miss Bronson is all kinds of upset because her supposed dad is now questioning if he really is her dad. She's adamant though. Mr. Roberts is her pops, no ifs, ands, or buts. Your Honor, I feel Mr. Roberts is my father. He's the only father I've known for 29 years. That's my father. Period. I know him my whole life. He the only one I call my father. That's who I grew up known as my father. So Mr. Roberts is my biological father. That's it. So here's Mr. Roberts, right? He's been dishing out cash for Miss Bronson's whole life, even though his name's nowhere on her birth certificate. Talk about commitment. 
the times I was there and I was also on child support. Are you on her birth certificate? Oh, Your Honor, I'm not on her birth certificate. So, Miss Bronson, all your life, the man that you were told was your father, you believed father, and you had no reason to doubt it. Yes, Your Honor, up until 2009. So, back in 2009, Miss Bronson's mom drops a bombshell over the phone, mentioning Mr. Banks and hinting he might be her real dad. Imagine that call, hey, honey, remember that guy I said might be your dad? Like, what? What happened in 2009? I had a phone conversation with my mother, then she mentioned Mr. Banks, and she said, don't you remember the guy that I told you thought he was your father? When she said that to me, Your Honor, it was a what moment, like, what are you talking about? She said that he wanted to get in contact with me. I gave her my number to give to him, or she gave me, I can't remember how we actually got in contact, and then I, we reached out to one another. Did you know Mr. Banks? You know who he was? No, Your Honor. Imagine chilling out and your fiance comes up and says, babe, we need to talk. You might not be Miss Bronson's dad. Mr. Roberts probably needed a stiff drink after that chat. Hang tight. It's about to get even wilder. A few years ago, Miss Blair told me that she needed to talk to me about something, and that's when I found out. I was kept in the dark about all this. I never knew anything about Mr. Banks. I also, you know, spent eight months in jail for unpaid child support, $75,000 in the rear. You didn't get a call. Your fiance comes to you and says... Possibility that Jasmine is not my biological daughter. Here comes Mr. Banks with a story about a park meetup ages ago where Miss Bronson's mom hinted that he could be the daddy. And all this based on a family resemblance. Family reunions must be fun with these guys. When did you become aware that you potentially could be Miss Bronson's biological father? I can recall uh, when she was about six or seven and I ran to her mother, Jasmine, and her sister in the park. Then they, uh, she had told me that Jasmine, my daughter then. Oh, do you remember the words she used? No, I don't. She's, I just recall her saying that Jasmine was my daughter. This whole time, poor Mr. Roberts was out of the loop about these paternity whispers. Then Mr. Banks strolls back into the picture, stirring up all sorts of family drama. I knew nothing of Mr. Banks. I dated Miss Bronson. I even married her two months after Jasmine was born, and I went on my business as raising as the start of my family. But possibly, if I'd known that earlier, it probably wouldn't have been. I would have discontinued that relationship. And I look at it like this. As being young, I would have been like, well, I dodged the bullet. I did the best, and I took responsibility. Mr. Roberts is feeling all the feels, upset about being the last to know he might not be the dad. He's wondering why no one bothered to clue him in sooner. Talk about feeling left out of the loop. Yeah, because we've been on vacation, birthdays, you know, we she came down to Maryland, lived, lived with us for eight years, and now, you know, she got her first apartment, which we live in a complex. I live in, and she live in, around the corner. So taking them to school, her, her children taking them out my, we still involved in each other's life to this day. But we here to find out if I'm her biological father or Mr. Banks. Okay, everyone, here it comes. The DNA results are in, and guess what? It has been determined by this court. Mr. Robert, you are not the father. She's still my daughter. I love you. You're always going to be my daughter. Here we go, folks. Mr. Redmond is introduced. He asserts that he owes over $10,000 in child support for two daughters, LaQuandria and Keisha Redmond, whom he claims are not his. This sets the stage for the court case, highlighting the central conflict over paternity and financial responsibility. Mr. Redmond, you currently owe more than $1,000 in child support for the defendant's two teenage daughters, LaQuandria Redmond and Kaisha Redmond, who you say are not yours. Miss Patterson, you say you are 100% certain that both girls are his daughters, and you cannot wait to prove the truth. Get a load of this. Mr. Redmond talks about his time in the slammer because of the child support debacle, emphasizing the hefty consequences he's faced. He whips out some paperwork to show Judge Lake, proving the mountain of cash he owes, and dives into the legal muddles that have turned his life upside down. But hang on, the soap opera's just getting started. Over 19 years, I've been taking care of these kids, Your Honor. I've been going to jail, and I know for a fact that these kids aren't mine. I've gone to jail because I owe more than $10,000. What is that, sir? This is a, some from the courts where I owe over $10,000 in child support. Paper. Let me see that paperwork, Troy. You all are married. No, ma'am. You're not married. Divorce. Divorce now. You're not going to believe this bit. Marshall steps up with some juicy evidence that hints at Ms. Patterson's possible infidelity. This includes a rather compromising scenario with Ms. Patterson and another dude, which Mr. Redman caught with his own eyes, fueling his doubts about being the daddy. Buckle up because it's about to get even juicier. Your Honor, as you can plainly see, her and her friend was in the bathroom and he had his pants down. That what? Is a lie. To the bathroom, Your Honor. His pants was down. And he quickly tried to pull them up. What? Yes, Your Honor. You all were dating? Yes, Your Honor. You're saying that's not true? That's not true. Oh boy, here's a twist. Mr. Marshall spills the beans about catching Ms. Patterson in bed with another man at her workplace. This bombshell adds a whole new level of drama and complicates the story about Ms. Patterson's loyalty. You'll want to stick around because the next part is a doozy. What is this? I went to Ms. Patterson's workplace. But at this point in time, at her job,
job. The front people told me where she was at, how to find her location. I went back there, find the location that they told me to go. Miss Patterson in the bed with another man on top of the man. Really? So this is you observing? Yes, ma'am. Guess what's next? The spotlight swings to Kashia as Mr. Redmond questions if he's really her pops too. He describes how frosty things got at home, including opting for the couch instead of the bed, which he reckons supports his claim of not being the father. Just when you think it can't get more tangled. I was so furious with Miss Patterson when we left her hometown. I slept on the couch. I wouldn't even sleep in the bed with her. The reason why he ain't sleeping in the bed, he was never at home. He'll come home when it's time for me to go to work. How you gonna sleep in the bed and you too much in the streets? Because I didn't want to look in your face. <laughs> Now, this is heart-wrenching, but kinda sweet. Kayashia and Lequandria Redmond step into the courtroom, sharing their feelings about Mr. Redmond, who they've been told is their father all along. Their emotional accounts shed light on how this paternity mess has affected them personally and how they feel about Mr. Redmond's dad skills, or lack thereof. But don't go anywhere. The emotional roller coaster is about to hit a big drop. Even as children, you all don't remember when I was always taken to go to his mother's house because he didn't have a house. He's always in and out of my life. He never done anything for me. And that hurts you. I mean, it did, but then I had to realize again that has it hurt you? When we was homeless and we had nothing, we called him and he never gave us nothing. Asked for money or anything. And now, a moment of truth. Drum roll, please. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Redman, you are the father. <laughs> we both look alike. All right, strap in, folks. The court kicks off with Mr. Poravecchio tossing a bombshell right out the gate. He's accusing Ms. Touche and her daughter, Ms. Lutz, of pocketing a cool $150,000 from his dad's death settlement by pretending Ms. Lutz is his sassis. He's pretty sure she's not, and that Ms. Touche has been playing the long con to snag that inheritance. Let's see how this wild ride unfolds. Mr. Poravecchio, you claim that the defendants, Ms. Touche and her daughter, Ms. Lutz, fraudulently received $150,000 in settlement money from the death of your father, Ricky Poravecchio Sr. Cause Miss Lutz is not your biological sister and her mother covered up that fact. Hold on to your popcorn. Mr. Poravecchio dives deeper into the soap opera that is his family's drama. He details how his dad met his watery end while working on a tugboat and how it was all written off as an accident. But there's a twist. He's not buying the whole happy family picture and insists on a DNA test to prove his point. Buckle up because there's more juicy drama ahead. Mr. Poravecchio, how have you and your family been defrauded frauded by the defendant. My father was on a tugboat working and he drowned. Accidental debt is what it said on his death certificate. You're not gonna believe this part. The courtroom turns into a daytime drama as they hash out Ms. Lutz's real last name. Born Thiel but later switched to Poravecchio to cash in on some sweet social security benefits. The plot thickens with family secrets spilling out. This inheritance tangle is just getting good, folks. I have evidence right here on a birth certificate. You submitted this birth certificate because you originally she was named, Ms. Lutz was named Thiel. And then then later on, her last name was changed to Provecchia. You felt like she in some way affect settlement distribution? Correct, Tell Your Honor. Me. A week after my, my dad was declared deceased, Miss Lutz was named changed from Theo. Oh boy, grab your tissues or your giggles. Family members are really laying it on thick, sharing sob stories and pointing fingers about who did what at family picnics. Miss Lutz pulls at the heartstrings, talking about her daddy issues and trying to reclaim her Poravecchio status. But don't wander off. The blame game is about to hit overtime. Because I have never heard that I was not a poor Vecchio. I got into never, it on Facebook. I've he never actually met my mom at Mardi Gras and begged her to let us in, let us back in her life. Yes, did. I did. And then when we were at a restaurant celebrating my brother's birthday after being in contact for a year with her parents. Do you remember that? Yes. And I remember it very clearly. She made my brother, my brother it's cry. Can it get any spicier? Yep. Now they're throwing around accusations of Ms. Tache stepping out on Mr. Poravecchio Sr. with some mystery man. She's all denials and eye rolls, swearing it's all a big misunderstanding. This family feud is serving up more twists than a pretzel factory, and trust me, you don't want to miss what's next. When Ricky and I first met, I was uh, somewhere around 16 years old. I mean, we just immediately, he's a handsome, good-looking Italian man. I just couldn't help myself. I fell in love, and it was just him and I, just us together. Things were great. I got pregnant. I was almost 18 years old because he started showing signs of jealousy, issues going on. We got past that. Here it comes, the moment of truth. The DNA results are in, and guess what? It has been determined by this court. Mr. Porvecchio and Ms. Lutz are siblings. Thank I you. Told Keep up, Ricky. I told Keep you. Keep up. You ruined up. So he come picks me up in the stolo. Getting re I'm getting dressed or whatnot. I'm looking out the window. He like, yeah, but I'm out. Next thing you know, we come to the police like, freeze. Get out the car. I'm like, really? Okay, 
to pick me up in the stolen car. I left school two miles to a family's home, knocked on that door, no answer. Been Looked through that. the peephole, shadows moving all around. No. Tiptoeing towards the door. So I parked myself on that concrete Your stand in just four or five hours till they had to come out. Everybody running out the house. And I called a guy over the one time. I knocked on the door. She's trying to hide a dude in the bathroom. It's, I mean, multiple occasions. There was not no multiple, it, 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 multiple occasions. Guys. You only seen one. I only one. seen it one time, exactly. but everybody tell me. You're not going to believe this one. Miss Tori steps up with a zinger, accusing Mr. Goodson of bailing on being the dad to her two ankle biters. While Miss Henderson isn't having any of it either, claiming he's dodging daddy duties for her four-year-old tyke too. They're both gunning for DNA tests and some wallet opening from Mr. Goodson. The courtroom's heating up with all these spicy accusations. Buckle up, there's more drama ahead. Miss Tori claim the defendant is denying he is the father of your two kids. And Miss Henderson, you state Mr. Goodson refuses to take responsibility for your old daughter. You have both asked the court to award paternity tests and enforce his financial obligation as a father. Check out this curveball. Mr. Goodson throws a soft pitch, hoping the tests prove he's the papa, despite rumors he's been playing the field. And Miss Henderson, she's calling foul, saying the player might have hit a home run with her and his cousin around the same bases. This tangled love triangle's got more twists than a pretzel factory, and it's only getting twistier from here. Additionally, you state Miss Henderson slept with you and your cousin in the same time frame, and therefore you can be sure Which was a lie. her daughter is yours. My story is that I went on a chat line one day. I met his cousin on the chat line. His, he know that was just looking for someone to hang out with on, you know, a regular basis. Oh boy, grab your popcorn. So, Miss Henderson spills the beans about a date gone wild, featuring a getaway car that was more stolen than borrowed. Yep, their night out flashed red and blue as the cops crashed their party. Talk about a bad first impression. Keep watching. It's about to go off the rails. I'm like, yeah, you come see me. What's up? So he came to see me in the solo, which they call down in St. Louis. It's a stolen car. So he come picks me up in the solo. Getting re I'm getting dressed or whatnot. I'm looking out the window. He like, yeah, but I'm out. Next, you know, here come the police. Like, freeze. Get out the car. I'm like, really? You came to pick me up in the stolen car? Really? Right. Oh, no, not about that. Yeah. This part's a real soap opera. Just when you thought it couldn't get soapier, in walks Mr. Thomas, another potential baby daddy in the saga of Miss Henderson's little one. Is he the father, or is it Mr. Goodson? It's like Maury Povich in here, but with more legal jargon. Don't touch that dial. The paternity puzzle isn't solved just yet. It's like a one-night thing. You know how it be some night. I get drunk, be with somebody. Might turn you on. Just happen. Right. Okay, I never so it's a one-night stand. So either you or your cousin, Goodson, father. Yes, ma'am. It's the big reveal time. Drum roll, please. It has been determined that when it comes to four-year-old Lazaja, Mr. Goodson, you are the father. Yeah. Okay. In a wild kickoff, Mr. Matlock spills the tea that he had to dip out for family stuff a while back. While he was gone, claims Ms. Monroe got a bit too cozy and invited her old flame to crash at their pad. This drama sets up a wild ride of a court case. Just wait, it gets even crazier from here. Mr. Matlock, yes, you say that a few years back you were suddenly called away at family business. Yes, while Your Honor. absent, you claim the defendant, Ms. Monroe, invited her former lover to move into your family home. Your Honor, that's correct. Hold on to your popcorn, folk. After Mr. Mr. Matlock comes back and forgives Ms. Monroe, they get back to business as usual. Boom, she hits him with news of a bun in the oven, and oh, maybe it's not his. What comes next will have you picking your jaw off the floor. Upon your return, you say you gave her and resumed your sexual relationship. Yes. But then she dropped the bombshell that she was in, and you might not be the father exactly. of her child. Things heat up as Ms. Monroe admits she's really not sure who the daddy is. She defends her sketchy moves by saying Mr. Matlock ghosted her the whole time he was gone, making her think he was out for good. The tea gets even hotter in the next bit. You admit that you have serious about the paternity of your child. Well, you argue that when Mr. Matt left family business, he stopped answering your phone calls, texts for an entire month. Yes, Your Honor. That's not correct. In your defense, you say you believe he was never coming back again. Yes, Your Honor. As they dive into their rocky past, Mr. Matlock lays out all their dirty laundry, questioning the trust and loyalty in their relationship. The back and forth about his trip and her moving the ex in just adds more spice to the drama stew. Buckle up, because the next part is a doozy. Back in 2006, when me and Monroe first got together, she knew I was back and forth from Fort Smith to Fayetteville because I had for a week. No, so yeah, you, no it no, was you a week. You're you lying. were gone a month. Anyway, Your Honor, you were gone a month. when I was gone for a week, no, you, she moved her ex into our, our, our home in one week, Your Honor. At what point do you find 
that she's moved another man into the house. Huh? Yikes! Talk about a communication fail. Mr. Matlock apparently turned into a ghost, not answering calls, which Ms. Monroe says led her to shuffle her ex into their home. The mess just snowballs from here, leading to an even bigger facepalm moment. He never answered my calls. Went on for a whole month. What number you called? So Mr. Matlock, were you getting phone calls from Monroe and not answering? No, Your Honor, I called her when I called her, but I don't feel like when I'm spending time with my son, I should have to drop her every to waking minute. Still have to talk to me if I'm your girlfriend. You should care. I'm not. I'm if you would have gave me a reason, then I wouldn't have block. you. In a what were you thinking moment, Ms. Monroe confirms she did indeed move her ex into their love nest when Mr. Matlock went AWOL. This bombshell obviously complicates things big time once Mr. Matlock returns. Grab your snacks, because this next revelation is a hoot. Mr. Matlock, you return home. Put her ex out, talked on the phone because about, I about the you. situation. I, didn't want him. I had feeling for her. I've been knowing I've been knowing her since we were 12, 13. So I still I had I felt something about her. So we worked out the whole situation. I eventually moved back in the house, picking up a sexual relationship with her again. Just when you think things couldn't get more bonkers, Ms. Monroe drops a bomb. Mr. Matlock might not be the daddy. This plot twist kicks off a wild ride through paternity court. Keep watching because the fallout is just too good to miss. Am I father of the child? Who's the baby daddy? Honored, right? She and looked at she me said? and I said, you're not father. Can't make it up. That's what she said. You are not the father. So I'm not taking care of somebody else, baby, and you tell me that that baby is not my baby. So, you didn't say that. You are no, not the father. Get this. Mr. Matlock ends up on the hook for child support because he missed his court date. Talk about a bad day getting worse. The financial and emotional roller coaster that ensues is something straight out of a soap opera. The climax is just around the corner, and it's a big one. And I missed my court date, and I was bothered by the fault. I have evidence proof that, Your Honor. When that court date came up, Mr. Matlock, you saying you never got no, notice of when your court date no, was. So you didn't show you weren't there. You were determined to be the father. I'm the father. And the father. you have so some paperwork. And here it is, the moment of truth. When it comes, five-year-old Kenya, you are not. I knew it! Put somebody else on child support. I want my money back. All right, buckle up for this one. Mr. Dansby finally spills why he took forever to ask for a DNA test. He blames Miss Simpson's web of lies and a mysterious other dude for his doubts about being little Denoris's daddy. The plot thickens, so stick around. The reason why it took three years, man, because Miss Simpson, she she had been lying to me. She had been, it was so much shade. She had another dude who she was dealing with. I mean, it was one Really? No. What it was that I had been trying to get you do a DNA test, but you chose to run. You didn't want to go to the child support place, do the DNA test. Here comes Mr. Dansby trying to wiggle his way out of this pickle. The judge grills him on why it took him so long to reach out to his maybe son, Denoris. Mr. Dansby blames Miss Simpson for playing keep away, which he says stopped him from connecting with the kiddo. Hold on. It's about to get even juicier. Mr. Dansby, let me ask you this, though. What have you made to try to get I, the well, DNA test? Well, well you earned it was times where I had reached out to Miss Simpson. I had got in contact with Miss Simpson through phone. It was so much as my son. Why I, you brought the kid around me, Carol? No. Why should I have to? So bring you nobody made enough of an effort to get a DNA test. That's why you're here today. You're not gonna believe this. Mr. Dansby dishes out a soap opera worthy morning tale where he finds out another guy is in the picture right as he's sending the kids off to school. The drama's not stopping here. Keep watching. Man, we met through a mutual friend. She moved me into her home where she was staying there with her other two kids. Miss Simpson had another man who she was dealing. With. I was getting her kids is ready for school. I got them on the school bus. Miss Simpson was taking a shower that morning. I just so happened caught the phone call. It was another dude. He was shocked to hear me. I don't like recall of that. And she told me that it was the dude that was phone me. No, okay. no, no. Just when you thought it couldn't get more dramatic, Miss Simpson goes feeling all queasy, and boom, a pregnancy test turns positive. Mr. Dansby's suspicion meter goes through the roof because, let's face it, the timing's as shady as a large oak tree. Don't go anywhere. The roller coaster's just hitting the big drop. Are okay, you... after, after the strange phone call, she had went to visit her dad in her hometown. Well, he from, which is Vidalia George. Okay, we went down there. She said she was feeling sick that particular day. And we I was. To the pharmacy, she went and took a, a pregnancy test. She said she it came out to find out that she was pregnant. I immediately Right assumed. from the so beginning. if you had right your dog, the, if right you didn't think that this baby was yours, why did you so-called put on like you was happy? Grab your popcorn, folks. Mr. Dansby pulls out a timeline that's more tangled than last year's Christmas lights. He's connecting dots, pointing fingers, and making sure everyone knows just how mixed up this whole story is. What's next? More bombshells, obviously. This is my timeline. You're Outlines like, all of the lies. We met through a friend. In November 2011, that's when you got the old man phone call. Yes, I got the phone.
phone call from the old dude. He was shocked to hear me just like I was shocked to hear from him. She announces the pregnancy. She she announced that she told everyone she was pregnant. I had my doubts about it, about her being so pregnant. So you were doubtful again and there was something shady going on then yes. too. Here's a heart tugger. Mr. Dansby meets his potential mini-me for the first time and it's as awkward as a high school dance. He's feeling all the feels but mostly confusion and distance because, well, he's been out of the loop for three whole years. Fasten your seatbelts. We're diving deeper. October 2014. I, I, yeah, when you October say it's the first time you that, met Tenoris, what that, was shady about that? That was my first time ever seeing Tenoris. Feel like it is so, and she's saying, and she's so confident about this, my son. Why? It took for me to, uh, three years for me to see Tenoris. But I got Ebony that. Okay, we did. You take put a on picture. Facebook. I'm, it is a picture of his Norris. I he told said. things are heating up. Miss Simpson and Mr. Dansby go head to head like two Rams fighting over who made less effort to get in touch. It's a back and forth of you didn't call me first. That's sure to get some eye rolls and laughs. I really do feel deep down that she was me, man. Dodge you for what? Why would I want to dodge you? Because you had been lying. child that need a father when my child need a father. Man, I, my daddy went there for me when I was a kid. So I take this very light. For, I do want to know that who his father is. I do want to be his father. Because you, you don't say. want that cycle. Because I want the kids of my own. I got three girls. Now we're talking turkey, or er, money. The judge breaks down who paid what for Denoris's upkeep. And let's just say it's not adding up for everyone. Mr. Dansby's been sending cash via paycheck garnishments, but Miss Simpson says it's not enough. Get ready, the verdict's about to drop, and it's a biggie. Now, you came to court suing $3,361.56. You do acknowledge you've received $240 far from Mr. Dansby. Yes, Your Honor. So for that reason, the court can award you $3,121.56. Kyle Rearing Fences. Buckle up, folks. Ray kicks things off with a bank claiming her ex-boyfriend, Mr. Lacey, is definitely the dad of her grown son. She's here to prove it once and for all, spicing up the court with her determination and the juicy details of their past. And folks, it gets even juicier from here. Mr. Ray, you are in court proof to your ex-boyfriend, Mr. Lacey, that is the biological father of your adult son, Von Lacey. You state that the defendant has been an absentee father full of excuses and you want it all to end day in court with the truth. Yes, Your Honor. Here's where it heats up. Trayvon, the son in question, throws down the gauntlet, calling Mr. Lacey an absentee dad, <sighs> loaded with excuses. He's all fired up, wanting today to be the day they end this drama and get to the truth. Hang tight. The courtroom's about to turn into a sauna. Well, it's not fair to my son, and he you really need a man up, because he's depriving my child of a father. He is the father of my son. You believe that you are not Trayvon's biological father? Yes, ma'am. believe that from the beginning? Yes, Your Honor. Hold on to your popcorn, folks. Just when you think it couldn't get more tangled, it's revealed Mr. Lacey's name is on the birth certificate. Talk about a plot thickener. This twist adds layers of mystery and potential chaos. You won't believe how they try to unravel this knot. So this birth certificate, child's name, Trayvon Lacey, father's name, Larry Lacey, but it's typed in. Was he present at the birth? He was not present, no. You basically just gave them his name. I gave him his name. And they typed it in. Yeah. Things just got real. Mr. Lacey shares his shocker moment when he first found out about the paternity claim, leading to a surprise invitation to child support court. It's like a soap opera with legal jargon. And trust me, the drama is only ramping up from here. Mr. Lacey, when did you find out that she claimed were Trayvon's biological father? Uh, I say Trayvon probably was a about between three and six months years old. I received court paper, State of Ohio uh, Child Support Court. Me and Ms. Torre, we did both appear at the Child Support Court. When I walked into the court, the judge, he looked at me, he said, this your son, you have nothing to say. As the plot thickens, the court digs into the child support dough Mr. Lacey has been shelling out. He confirms he's been paying up, despite the daddy drama. This bit is crucial, because it sets the stage for some major emotional fireworks that are about to blast off. Far and his court papers say, paying child support? You yes, child I have, support. I I have proof that, Your Honor. But Your Honor, I want to put this to bed. I'm tired of reliving that. You know, okay, I made a mistake. What is even a mistake? I was just living on my own. And I, he just keep throwing his man in my over and making my son feel bad. I, I'm ready to put it to bed. That's what I wanted and get on with our life. Feel the tension in the air? Both sides are worn out from the drama and just want to know if Mr. Lacey is really the pops. It's a tug of war with emotions and everyone's on edge. But hold on to your seats because the truth bomb is about to drop. Nor is my intention to make Mr. Torre feel bad. The thing I want to know is the truth. There is an in fact, a question, a real question of paternity. Both sides acknowledge. Uh, you presented this evidence to the court, which indicates that you, you owe thirty-seven thousand two hundred and some odd dollars in child support. You're down to five thousand dollars. You've got about five thousand yeah. eight hundred dollars. Get ready for some gossip. Ray spills the tea on how she and Mr. Lacey first got together, complete with the steamy details of their early flings. It's a real tell-all moment that sheds light on their rocky romance. And folks, you're gonna want to stick around for the blockbuster DNA reveal. But I just moved in town. I got my new apartment. I was feeling all grown in my apartment, doing grown mm -hmm. stuff in my grown. Well, I didn't find out until I went to the OBGYN, and I, at that time,
time here, he told me that I was like 12 to 14 weeks already into my pregnancy. And he was the only man I had had sex at, in that time frame. Because I didn't have any, 12, I didn't know nobody else. pregnant. We had only been together for no more than a month. How could Trayvon be my child? Here it comes. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Lacey, you are the father. Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. I told you, told you. Now stand up, give my son his respect. Get ready for a wild ride. The show kicks off with the judge diving straight into the drama, asking Ms. Butler to spill the beans about whether Mr. Wilson really is little Nyona's dad. Ms. Butler is all in, totally convinced that Nyona is his kiddo, setting us up for a roller coaster of a court session. You're not gonna wanna miss what comes next. Or we go through all the trouble of hearing a ton of testimony. Uh, why don't you just be honest, Ms. Butler, and let us know that you really believe Mr. Wilson is Nyona's biological father. I really feel like she his. I do. Things are heating up. Ms. Butler is sure that Nyona belongs to Mr. Wilson, but kind of wobbly about Zaria. This confession stirs up a whole pot of questions about both kids and what Mr. Wilson's deal is with them. Hang on, because it's about to get even juicier. If you had to doubt one of the children, you really didn't know if Zariah's his, but Nyana, you're pretty confident about. Nyana's definitely yours. You said that about the other one. We just heard that same testimony, didn't we, Jerome? Yeah. Did that the, both of the kids was yours? We always had sex without no condom. Hold on to your popcorn, folks. The judge isn't pulling any punches, calling out Ms. Butler on her questionable mothering skills amid all the chaos. This serious chat really digs into the family mess and what's expected of a mom in this courtroom. And guess what? It only gets wilder from here. Because I want to get the information on Nyana because I do want her to know who her biological yeah. father is. I'm disappointed, Ms. Butler. You a mother. No, she's not at all. Don't have a clue what being a mother is. I do love my kids. Don't have so. a clue what being a mother is. And I do want to do better. I actually do. Can you believe this? We dive into the soap opera of their relationship when Neona was conceived. Mr. Wilson paints a picture of a not-so-cozy love nest with Ms. Butler, complete with other dudes and sneaky moves, complicating the whole who's your daddy question. What was this relationship then? You were living in an apartment, so I would come over periodically to check on the kids. We might have sex sometime, but um, everybody in the apartment talking about everybody running out the house, and I called a guy over the one time, I knocked on the door. She's trying to hide a dude in the bathroom. It's, I mean, multiple occasions. There was not no the, multiple, multiple occasions. Guys. You only seen one? I only one. seen it one time, Is but that... everybody tell me. Boom! Drama bomb dropped. Mr. Wilson catches another guy at Ms. Butler's place, right when Nyona might have been made. This juicy bit shakes up the whole paternity claim Ms. Butler has been making. Just been my path, then the guys in the apartment telling me, um, he everybody just been, been, up been thinking and guessing. I ain't been guessing. That's all he been doing. People, people don't know me like that, they wouldn't lie to me. Man, your baby mama, man, she gonna have this dude, that dude. No, oh you know. my God. So, so Mr. Okay. Wilson, what happened when you found out pregnant with Nyona? I told her it wasn't my baby. You gotta see this. The judge tackles the sad reality that Mr. Wilson isn't really playing dad to Nyona, pointing out how this could mess up the little one. This heart to heart is all about how important it is for a dad to be in the picture. The next clip is a real tearjerker, or maybe not. What kind of relationship does she have with Mr. Wilson? None at all. He don't really come by to see her. Nothing really. Can't come by. Too many men running in and out. Can't come by. I'm scared to go over there. I took him from her house and moved him in with me. I didn't want them kids to be around that man. So you have the two kids, I, my two kids. with your last name. Yeah. It's crunch time. As we gear up for the big DNA reveal, the room's buzzing with tension. The judge lays down the law, schooling both parents on how they're messing up big time. And just when you think it can't get more intense, we're about to drop the big news. We're gonna find out right now because I'm about sick of y'all. I really am. This is just so ragged. Yeah, it is ragged. No, it really is. And you sitting up in here just talking like you on a playground somewhere. No, yo, you, no, what? And yo, listen to me. Stomach growing instead of your mind. Here comes the moment of truth. The results are in and bam. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Wilson, you are the father. <laughs> Mr. Lillard spills the beans on why he had to drag this case into court, all because of a bombshell message last year from Ms. Holt's 20-year-old son, Delvin Holt. Ms. Holt vents about her 20-year struggle to get Mr. Lillard to step up and take responsibility for Delvin. The segment wraps up with the judge seeking confirmation on the day's agenda, and Ms. Holt is like, yep, that's the plan, Your Honor. Mr. Lillard, you say you were forced to open this case after receiving a message last year from Ms. Holt's 20-year-old son, Delvin Holt. Ms. Holt, you say you have unsuccessfully tried for 20 year get Mr. Lillard to accept responsibility for your son, Delvin, and today is the day he is finally going to accept the truth. Yes. Mr. Lillard gets all nostalgic, revealing intimate details about his past. With Ms. Holt, turns out she was his first in a bunch of things. Cue the audience all. He reminisces about the love and heartbreak she brought into his life, sharing a glimpse into their deep yet rocky past. I'm just saying, I had a lot of admiration for her, but it's also my first heartbreak, first person I really experienced what pain was. You know, it's not been no back and forth fighting over the years, it's been a 
a very cordial thing. She made some mistakes that cost everybody a lot of pain right now, me and him. Pain. You know? So, what Miss... do with him? Mr. Lillard uncovers the sticky mess of catching Ms. Holt cheating, sparking off a major drama. He tells a wild tale of skipping school and trekking two miles to confront her, culminating in a classic peek through the peephole moment. Oh, well, it's very sunny, bright day. Decided not to be at school. I left school two miles to a family's home, knocked on their door, no answer. Looked like through that. the peephole, shadows moving all around. No. Tiptoeing towards the door. So I parked myself on that concrete Your steady Honor. four or five hours till they had to come out. It, 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 was, it wasn't even in there that long, so you... Amid a fiery back and forth about who did what and who saw whom, Ms. Holt tries to set the record straight that it was just a friend at her place, not a lover. The conversation hits a peak when she admits to also testing another dude for paternity, thickening the plot. Yeah. Who was in the house with you? That was just a friend. It just friend. We was not in there for no four hours. Maybe it was like 10, I 15 minutes. I left second minutes. period. Second period, that's early no, in the morning. No, it was not. So you got third period, fourth period, time, fifth period, and sixth period. In this tearjerker segment kicking, Delvin steps into the spotlight to share his side of the story, talking about growing up without Mr. Lillard. His mom reinforces his belief about Lillard being the pops, priming us for some major revelations. My mom has always told me he was my father. I just basically came here to let him know I don't need a father, but I just really want to come to find out if he is so I can have closure, me and my mom. I mean, you can tell on the pictures, they look just alike. It's not a secret. <laughs> it really felt, it, it hurt me a little bit. Any kid needs a father, you feel me? The big reveal happens here. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Lillard, you are not the father. Okay, baby. I had a boyfriend at the time. The father the of whole the child time. came to my house, told me they got a DNA test with somebody else, so I moved on with my life. What else am I supposed right, to do after because, the head no. of your household comes no, to man. me? That Chris and I, I kept telling him that this is his child. No, you you don't know what I, I know tell what you him. Phone, that's that's what, I what I said to your that's phone, but you don't know what I tell well, this man. Day, don't I been with him about what I tell him or what we discuss. But she ain't there and she don't know. I told him that child's father. I've had a couple people tell me, hey, you know, Miss Pernari's out here cheating on you. And I find out she's sleeping on a couch with another guy naked, taking a shower with another guy this whole time. I'm away. The times don't add up to when I came back for it to be my kid. Hold on to your popcorn, folks. A guy just waltzed into court claiming he's the long-lost dad of Ms. Brown, who's standing there with her mom, Alicia, looking like they've just seen a ghost. This dude, Mr. Hampton, who slid into her Facebook DMs claiming he's her daddy. Just when you thought your social media was drama-free, this saga takes it to a whole new level. I was you or your adopt parents know about how things were, but I'll be more than willing to answer your question. Here comes Mr. Hampton, strutting in like he pregnant. All right, Mr. Hampton is now playing show and tell with some old toys and folks because this mystery is about to get even juicier. Do you have any proof of this? The, the toys that I first uh, bought her before before they left, Your Honor, me, that's my daughter here, and, and, and that's her mother, Your Honor. Things are heating up as Miss Alicia, Kayla's adoptive mom, recognizes a photo but calls BS on Mr. Hampton's story. It's like watching a tennis match with the back and forth between these two. You won't want to miss what's thrown into the mix next? It's a curveball. Ms. Brown, is this a picture of you? I think it. Eye. Cash, while Ms. Brown has paperwork saying otherwise. Fasten your seatbelts. The revelations coming up are mind-blowing. What are you... The paperwork you completed states there is an order for child support in Alaska and that the order names you as the father. Are you ready for this? The big reveal is here. All right, strap in for this doozy. Mr. Johnson throws down the gauntlet, accusing Ms. Carr of yanking his chain about being daddy-o to her daughter for nearly two decades. He's all kinds of stirred up about the roller coaster of daddy drama. Ms. Carr claps back, claiming Mr. Johnson has been playing hide and seek with both a DNA test and his daddy duties. Mr. Johnson, you say the defendant, Mrs. Carr, has been playing an emotional DNA game with you over her daughter's paternity for the past 18 years. You've brought her to court to finally end the game and prove you are not her daughter's biological father. Hold on to your popcorn, because this plot twist is a real kicker. The courtroom dives into the nitty-gritty of Mr. Johnson and Ms. Carr's hit-and-run kind of fling. Mr. Johnson lays it out that they were barely a thing, just a one-night bender, which Ms. Carr totally disputes, saying there was more than one roll in the hay. The plot thickens as they untangle their brief and chaotic connection. Brace yourself, because the next bit is a real eyebrow raiser. Take me back to the nature of this relationship. My uncle married her auntie. They adopted her. I used to go over their house and help him out, like, cutting grass 
gas and things of that nature, and I would stay the night. They would allow us to sleep in the same room. We had sex one time. It was a lot of touchy feely before, and the one time we had sex, it was wham bam, thank you, ma'am. Honor's not true. You can't make this stuff up. The chit chat swings to the aftermath of baby making, where Mr. Johnson was originally dubbed Daddy, only to get the psych, not your kid bomb dropped on him, thanks to another guy's paternity test. This bombshell left Mr. Johnson out in the cold for years, marinating in confusion and a whole lot of what the heck. The saga continues, and oh boy, it's about to level up. And then, once you had the baby, what did you do? Call him back and I did not say- call him, I did not pursue him. I had a boyfriend at time. The father the of whole the child time. came to my house, told me they had a DNA test with somebody else, so I moved on with my life. What else am right, I supposed to do after because, the head no. of your household comes no, to man, me and no. tell me that's not true. that Cue the surprise encounter. Years later, Mr. Johnson has a run-in at the grocery store with a little girl who calls him daddy out of the blue. Talk about a plot twist. This unexpected daddy call pushes Mr. Johnson to demand a DNA test to clear up this family mystery once and for all. The drama intensifies, and you won't believe the curveball coming next. Seeing the daughter in a grocery store, she run up to me like daddy, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, hey, I'm, I wanna say I'm not your daddy, but I can't tell this little girl this, you know what I'm saying? I recognize uh, the family members, so I just assumed this was, it was Miss her. May. But I'm confused as to why she's calling me daddy. Asking for a DNA test. Like, no, you can't just say that she's my yeah. daughter without me getting a DNA test. Grab your tissues because this part's a tearjerker with a twist of humor. Little Amber May, caught in the paternity pickle, shares her scant memories of Mr. Johnson, sprinkling in how she feels about being the odd one out in the daddy debacle. It's a poignant mix of sweet and sad as she unpacks her feelings of abandonment. Fasten your seatbelts because the emotional roller coaster is about to go off the rails. Memories with Mr. Johnson. My 10th birthday, he threw me a party at the water park. I remember that from summer after fifth grade. I remember that day because he made it in the house while all my cousins playing outside. There was a lot of boys out there. She was the only girl. I was not. Last time I saw Mr. Johnson was the fifth grade summer. It was probably around hmm. 2010. And here's the grand finale. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Johnson, you are her father. <laughs> Buckle up, Buttercup. Mr. Vadaboncourt kicks off the drama fest by trying to prove he's not the dad of Ms. Fernari's one-year-old son, Dawson. He's pretty much saying he wants to ghost her forever once the DNA test says he's off the hook. Let's see how this baby daddy drama unfolds. Mr. Vadaboncourt, you have petitioned the court to prove to Ms. Fernari that you are not the biological father of her one-year-old son, Dawson. You claim you can prove you're not father and when today's result, win your case, you want her out of your life for good. All right, spill the beans. Mr. V, Mr. Vadaboncourt, breaks down his relationship with Ms. Fernari, if you can even call it that. We're talking a couple of Facebook flirts, and bam, baby talk. He's adamant it was just a brief fling, while she's in the back ready to narrate a full-blown soap opera saga. Tell me about your relationship with Ms. Fernari. Well, Your Honor, there was really never no relationship. I met her over Facebook through my sister, and after that, I, I had unprotected sex with her. I ended up going away probably three to four days later. Now, six months down the road, get a letter from my sister stating that Fernari's pregnant. Hold the phone, folks. Ms. Fernari drops a truth bomb. Turns out she wasn't exactly waiting by the window while Mr. V was away. She admits to a side hustle with another dude, stirring up a whole can of who's the daddy worms. If you thought this was messy, just wait for the family to weigh in. That I had sex with another guy while he was away. Mr. Vadbonker, what were you told? I've had a couple people tell me, hey, you know Miss Fernari's out here cheating on you. And I find out she's sleeping on a couch with another guy naked, taking a shower with another guy this whole time I'm away. The times don't add up to when I came back for it to be my kid. Enter stage left. Ms. Janine Vadaboncourt, the sister with the scoop. She's supposed to back her bro, but plot twist. She's testifying for Team Fernari. She dishes all the gossip about Ms. Fernari's escapades. Drama alert! What she says next could turn the whole case upside down. You are a relation to Mr. Vadbonker? Yes, that's my brother. Tell me what you know! One night after we had all been drinking, she slept with one of the people that came to our little get-together. That's the only time I caught her cheating. I mean, I have I had visions, but... Why? Because of her talking on the phone, or... Um, just different behaviors and stuff, and I told my brother that- Grab your popcorn. This family feud is better than reality TV. We've got shouting, crying, and enough dirty laundry to keep a soap opera running. Each testimony is like a mini drama series, and nobody seems to agree on who did what or who saw whom. Make sure you're tuned in for the next revelation. It's a real jaw-dropper. Were you sleeping with multiple men during the window of concept? No, I wasn't, Your Honor. It's mutual. He cheated. They were cheating. It was back and forth. I know many times of him cheating on her. I, I know one time, really, of her. I don't know anything 
everything else. It was mutual. It was a very mutualist relationship between both of them. It was like fire and ice with them. It's crunch time and everyone's on edge. Mr. Vadaban Kaur and Miss Fernery throw their last cards on the table, hoping to sway the DNA gods in their favor. The air's thick with anticipation and last minute bombshells. Strap in because the verdict is about to blow everyone's minds. Is indeed determined that Mr. Vadbonker is Doss' biological father. Where do you go from here? I want him to be in Dawson's life. You want him to be a father? Yes, I want him to and be a father. And you will allow him. If Dad. he's not biological child, then what? I'll go my separate way. There's been so many times I have tried to do so many things. I think she has some kind of all doubt right. in her mind, no, not mine. We all know. Well, the only way to move she's forward is to get the result. Wait for it and boom. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Vadbonker, you are the father. That's Fine. your son, David. Fine. You can stop or you can be his dad. Hold on to your popcorn, folks. Ms. Norris is throwing down, claiming Mr. Johnny D. Norris Sr. has been dodging the dad label for 22 years. She's betting all her chips that the DNA results will slap a father tag on him. Ms. Norris, you claim Johnny D. Norris Sr. been denying he fathered your son for the past 22 years. You say today's paternity results will prove him wrong. Mr. Norris, you state that you've always known that Johnny Jr. is not your son, and today you believe the DNA finally Prove it. Here's a twist you didn't see coming. After popping out their son, Ms. Norris says they got hitched right in her dad's front yard. Talk about low-budget romance. But hold up, there's more to this soap opera just around the corner. After having my son, we were married by my father. Front yard, we had a yard wedding. Shotgun wedding, y'all. When she came pregnant, I myself, I thought it'd be the right thing to do as far as marrying her. I was kind of forced into it due to the circumstance. But I loved her at time, y'all. Yeah. I don't deny that. Forced. And as he said, we're in love. I know that I head over heels. Can you believe the nerve? As the judge digs deeper, Mr. Norris drops a bomb. His mother-in-law was throwing shade about him being the dad from the get-go, which totally messed with his head. Why does he deny you son? That, I don't know, you aren't. His grandmother said that I wasn't his father. I don't believe that. If that was, if she did say that to him, it was because she was just so fed up. At that time, you had just had your son and named him Junior. Yes, ma'am. So yes, you named Honor. after Senior over here. Yes, she aren't. Grab your tissues. This one's a tearjerker. Ms. Norris spills the beans about Mr. Norris bailing on their son's eighth birthday. Talk about bad timing. What comes next? More finger pointing and jaw dropping drama. That's what. I was totally in love with Mr. Norris here. And on my son's eighth birthday, that is the last time we seen him. He left. He disappeared. Um, that's not how it happened at all. Actually, proud to his birthday. Um, her and I wasn't getting along. There wasn't no need me hanging around. And like I said, she had been gone. You know, she'd be gone from time to time. So I was basically just there. You won't believe this mess. The courtroom turned turns into a he-said-she-said said battleground over cheating accusations. Mr. Norris claims he had to hightail it out of there because of Ms. Norris's alleged infidelities. Strap in, because the emotional roller coaster is just getting started. But, Your Honor, he oh. was the cheater. You said she was cheating, she says you were cheating. Yes, he was the but cheater. But why do you pick his eighth birthday to leave? It wasn't on his birthday. Junior, do you remember any of this? That last time I seen this man, he sat me on my lap, let me know that he was parting ways. I don't remember in um, detail. He parting ways with That's you or your mom? Parting ways, he had to he had to leave and he'll be back. Things are getting real now. Ms. Norris is all in. No doubts about Mr. Norris being the pops. Meanwhile, he's reeling from the supposed gossip his mother-in-law spread. The next testimony, it's a real kicker. Stay tuned. Was there any doubt with respect to the paternity? No, ma'am, not for me. I've always knew he was his father. And what about from Mr. Norris Sr.? He take care of Junior? Was he present while in his he, life? Till up until the time while he, there, his we, grandmother he did said contribute. that when she said he wasn't my son. He never... Now, that, that put a dagger in my heart because I was a young man. This is heavy, folks. Junior talks about how tough it was growing up dadless, which turned him into a bit of a rebel. It's raw, it's real, and it's a bit of a heart squeeze. But guess what? The biggest bombshell is just ahead. What was life like growing up without your father? What was it like after that moment? On the, uh, on the subject situation of my father not being there, you know, uh, induced a great deal of anger, you know, upon me. And I acted out in different subject ways, as in got in a variety of fights. I was very rebellious. Mm -hmm. Ms. Norris went detective mode to track down Mr. Norris years after he vanished. She's been holding a torch and a grudge, looking for some answers. And boy, does the next part drop a bomb. When I decided to search for him, it was about six years ago, I believe. I had moved to Georgia with a friend. She helped me to go online. We were able to find a family member of Mr. Norris. I gave them a number to contact me. He did. I gave him an address for my son to write him and promised that he would, which that never happened. Buckle up. Here comes the big reveal. It has been determined by this this court, Mr. Norris Sr., you are not his father. Oh. I told you, Your Honor. 
Guess who's back in court? Yep, Ms. Simmons strides in, claiming Mr. Burgess, the man with the wandering eye and a fiancé, got her pregnant and then ghosted. She's here to slap him with proof that he's the dad of her little boy, dropping a drama bomb right from the start. Ms. Simmons claimed that the defendant begged you to have his baby, but then disappeared when you told him you were pregnant. Yeah. So you're here to prove to Mr. Burgess and his fiancé that he is your son's father. Oh, snap. Here comes Mr. Burgess with a plot twist. He throws back that their fling was just a short sizzle and accuses Ms. Simmons of trying to pin another dude's baby on him. The air's getting spicy with all these accusations flying around. Just wait for the next bit. It's a doozy. Mr. Burgess, you say your relationship with the plaintiff was just a quick fling and Miss Simmons wants you to care of another man baby as well. Hello, drama. We're diving into how these two met and boy, it escalated quickly. From online chats to a turbocharged real-life hookup, they didn't waste any time. Ms. Simmons spills the tea on their quick move from hellos to the bedroom. Stick around. The fireworks are just about to start. How did you get involved with a man almost twice your age? We was talking online at first, and we was talking phone, and he had told me he's single and everything. Then we eventually we started. I had came to his house and everything. First day I did come to the house, so we did have sex on the first day. So we just was kicking it ever since then. Did you use protection? We was using condoms, but they kept breaking, so we stopped using condoms. Hold up, did he just say that? Judge Lake is on the case, grilling Mr. Burgess on his single status claim while he's clearly engaged. The courtroom's heating up with these sneaky revelations. You'll want to see what's coming. Trust me, it's worth the wait. Mr. Burgess, did you? You tell her you were single? Yes, ma'am, I did. You say you have a fiance? Yes, ma'am. If you were having sex and the condom kept breaking, is it that you can definitively say you are not Malachi's biological father? I had my doubts, you know, from, from just from her coming over there the first time I seen her, you know, chopped it up as soon as she came over there. How often did you have sex, Miss Simmons? We was always having sex. That's not true, y'all. Get ready for a showdown. Ms. Simmons and Mr. Burgess can't agree on how often they were getting cozy. He says a few times. She says all the time. It's a he said. She said with a side of sass. And oh, the next exchange? It's even juicier. When I met online, I talked to her once or twice. I got her number. We went from there. Three times, probably a week. I was over there like yeah. almost every day. If I wasn't at school or at, I was at your house, how is it only twice or three times? Don't lie because she's here. And you say he's not telling the truth, No, he lying. He lying. I was there almost every day. I was at his house all the time. Maybe three times a week. You a lie. Here's a twist. Mr. Burgess pulls out a poster to chart their liaisons as if he's unveiling a secret weapon. He's trying to math his way out of paternity with timelines and quick maths. Grab your popcorn, because the next part is even more enthralling. What proof do you have? I can go to the uh, poster here. Mm -hmm. See, three is meaning the first time she ever came to my house, it was within three hours of us having sex. That's very quick. Numbers yeah, don't uh, lie, you said. One time that we actually had unprotected sex, one day she told me she was pregnant. She told me you she was, was pregnant. The next day she Why was like, I'm lying? pregnant. I said, how you gonna know that? She was like, I know my body. Can you feel the tension? As soon as the pregnancy bomb dropped, Mr. Burgess turned into Houdini, trying to vanish into thin air. His disappearing act didn't go unnoticed. And oh boy, the courtroom's about to get even more heated. The day I took the pregnancy test, I had sent him a picture of the two pregnancy tests I took. So he was taking too long, I had called him. And when I spoke on the phone with him, I had just, I was going to school. I had a job and I was like, you know, I ain't ready to be nobody's mother. So he was like, yeah, don't cry. God know what he was doing, anything like that. So then that's when he had told me he was going to Alabama and everything. And I was like, what you going to Alabama for? And he's like, oh, I'm just going with some homies. Lies. Some homies. Enter stage left. Ms. Arnold, the fiance with detective skills. She caught a whiff of the drama when she spotted Ms. Simmons' digits on her man's phone. What she found out next could fill a soap opera episode by itself. I found out about so her. I went through his phone. He came to Alabama to visit me one week. It came to the point to where we he had to take him to the bus station to catch his bus to get back to Atlanta. He had to charge his phone up. But as soon as it comes on, two text messages pop up. He ended up falling asleep. And when I looked at the phone, the unknown number said, so this how you gonna do? You gonna send it me to the voicemail. So you just gonna stand me up. Call me when you get this message. Just when you think it's all out in the open, the stakes are sky high as they hash out whether Mr. Burgess is playing daddy denial to keep his relationship afloat. But wait, there's more. The next reveal is a real jaw dropper. We, we, we I petitioned this court for the paternity because because of Chris and I, I kept telling him that this is his child. No, you you don't know what I, I know tell what you him. That's, that's what, what I, I sent to your that's phone, but you don't know what I tell this man. Day, don't I've been with him about what I tell him or what we discuss. But she ain't there and she don't know. I told him that child's father. And, what, and that's what we used to get into it about, because I kept telling him, how are we going to deal with this situation? And here comes the big reveal. Drum roll, please. It has been determined by the court. The Burgess, you are the father.
Hold on to your popcorn, folks. Judge Lake kicks off the show. Miss Lawrence steps up with a doozy of a story, telling us about a family secret so big it could be its own reality show. She thought one dude was her dad for 28 years. But surprise, there might be another dad in the running. She's so serious about finding out, she's got a paternity test in hand. Miss Lawrence, you claim that six months ago, your mother and then shared a secret she'd kept from you your entire life. After 28 years believing one, you've petitioned the court for a paternity test. Find out if the man waiting outside of our courtroom today is indeed your biological father. No kidding, this just got real. Miss Simmons, the mom, owns up to keeping mum about the whole dad drama. She spills the beans about bumping into an old flame, Mr. Rochemore, on a bus and dropping the maybe your dad bomb on him for the first time. The plot thickens, and oh boy, Mr. Rochemore is about to walk in. Now, Miss Simmons, you admit to keeping a lifelong secret from your daughter. You claim you recently ran into an ex-lover on a bus. Uh, you say that for the very first time, told this man that he could be your daughter's dad. Uh, we'll meet him in just a few moments. Talk about a soap opera twist. Miss Lawrence tells us how her mom, in between sobs and sniffles, broke the news over the phone about potential dad number two. This call turned her world upside down, trashing their mother-daughter bestie status. Buckle up, because the emotional roller coaster is just leaving the station. She called me about six months ago. When I answered the phone, she was hysterically crying, and of course, I didn't know what was going on. And, um, I'm asking her what's wrong, beating around the bush, telling me all these random stories. And then finally, she goes into saying that she's some random man on the bus and that he could possibly be my father. You can't make this stuff up. Miss Simmons recounts that fateful bus meet, cute with Mr. Roquemore. <sighs> Recognizing him from a mile away, she confirms it's him. They swap numbers and start reminiscing about the good old days. And then, bam, she hits him with the possible daddy news. I ran into Rudy on the bus one day on the way from school. And I'm like, I know him, you know, from my past. I've never forgotten him. I say, excuse me, what is your name? Is your name Rudolph? He says, yes. I say, Rudolph Rockamore. He says, yes, it is. He asks me, who are you? And I look at him like this. I'm like, for real, really? And I'm like, I'm Yvette. <laughs> this is where it gets juicy. In the courtroom, Miss Simmons dives deeper into her bus convo with Mr. Rokamore, revealing she hinted at him possibly being the daddy. This is major, folks, setting us up for the big reveal. And trust me, you won't want to miss what's coming next. It's a doozy. In the conversation with Rudolph, I told him it's a possibility that I may have your child. What was his response? I said, say, what would make you think that it's my daughter? I say, because there's really no resemblance the man that she calls her father. I just want to know why you didn't tell me before. Like, I couldn't. I had no idea. Grab your tissues and maybe some popcorn. Miss Lawrence vents big time about feeling betrayed after learning the truth from her mom. The bond she thought was unbreakable, with her mom now has more cracks than a sidewalk. What's next? Oh, you'll want to stick around for the bomb they're about to drop. It hurts a lot. I never really knew that she, like, felt like that. Me not telling her was because I didn't want to hurt you her. You think that and it would hurt me more now than it would I never a long time thought ago? I would run into him, thought I would see him again. But that's what I want to know, too. Like, even if you didn't see him, like, I don't know. And here comes Mr. Rokemore, stepping into the spotlight for the first time. The air's thick with tension as he and Miss Lawrence size each other up. He admits there might be a resemblance, and everyone's on the edge of their seats. Next up, the DNA results. Are you ready for this jelly? When you look at her today, do you feel like this could be a real possibility? I could see some resemblance by the eyes. Miss Lawrence, how do you feel right I have butterflies in my stomach. I really do. I don't feel like there's any, like, attachment or, like, could be my dad. Or... Here it comes, a moment of truth. When it comes to 29-year-old Shatika, Mr. Rockmore, you are her father. Mm.